In this lesson, we're going to take a detailed look at a real estimate. It's my opinion that the best and proper way to build an estimate is by either compiling a detailed hand takeoff using a RS means book or by using computer software. Hand takeoffs, while detailed and able to suit our needs, take too much time. So, we're going to focus on using computer software. This method will also serve you better should you decide to take the step to the next level, which would be electrical estimator. The downside of computer estimating software is that it can be expensive. However, your company may have a subscription that they will be willing to let you use, and if not, I'm going to show you a couple of affordable solutions. The process of compiling an electrical estimate involves entering every piece of material that will be required to construct the electrical portion of the project into the computer. This is basically accomplished by going through the drawings to determine and identify each piece of material that will be required selecting that material from a material database within the estimating software and then entering the quantity. The estimating software will be structured in a way that will make the selection and entry of material easy and systematic. Based on our last lesson, the importance of capturing every piece of material that will be required to build the project should be obvious. If the estimator misses a piece of material in the estimate, not only will the cost of that material be missed, but the labor to install it will be missed as well. There's an old saying in the estimating industry that if you don't miss something in the estimate, you probably won't get the job. There's a lot of truth in that statement. So let's take a look at that for a minute. I think the thing I would like you to realize is that when you bid competitive projects, the project goes for the market value. This means that whatever price the most competitive or incompetent contractor submits could very well be the price the project is awarded for. Savvy estimators track the bid results on projects they bid. Normally, the general contractor will share this information with you if you call them and ask what the numbers were. By tracking these numbers on every project, you're eventually able to determine pretty closely where your competitors will be on bid day. If you include every nut, bolt, and washer in your takeoff and your price comes in higher than you think your competitor will be, how are you going to get below them in order to win the project? If you remove some of the material, it will just mean that you're going to have to buy material that you don't have money for, right? So you could say that you are going to trim your profit from 10% to 2%. That might give you the money to make up the difference. But companies who don't make a profit on their projects seem to disappear quickly so that's probably not a great idea. Of course, you could go back to your suppliers and see if they have any room to make up the difference, but this takes a good relationship with your supplier, and if you ask too often, you may lose their interests altogether. They're in business to make a profit as well, after all. That brings us to labor. You could screw down your labor a little, and that may possibly make up the difference, but you still have to get the material installed at that rate, or you're only fooling yourself, and you're going to end up using your profit to pay for labor anyway. The point I'm trying to make here is that as a contractor, your employer does not get to choose the price at which they win projects for you to wire. They cannot send a note along with their bid on bid day that says, Dear Contractor, our company is not able to build projects as cheaply as our competitors, so we know our price will be high, but if you'll give us this project, we promise to do a real nice job for you. 
That general contractor doesn't care what your problems are. They're bidding against other general contractors for the project as well. And they're most likely going to use the cheapest price they receive. That means your company has to take the project at the street price and find a way to complete it at that price. You play an important role in that by managing the labor at or below the projected price. There are several ways to format an estimate, and the better it's formatted, the easier it will be for you to manage your project. Unfortunately, most contractors don't spend very much time on formatting the estimate because they're trying to push as many estimates out as possible, and they don't want to invest the time required. Formatting is accomplished through what are called breakdowns. Basically, you can use as many different breakdowns as you want to achieve the level of formatting you're looking for. Here's a copy of an estimate that uses no breakdowns with absolutely no formatting whatsoever. So let's see if we can capture any information of value here. It does give us the description of the material in the project. For instance, here's the half inch EMT. It gives us the quantity of material, in this case, 6,490 feet. It gives us our price per unit, in this case, per 100 feet, $21.66 per 100 feet. The total cost for all the half-inch EMT in the project, $1,405.73. Labor hours per unit, in this case, 100 feet, 2.5 hours per 100 feet. And lastly, it gives us the total hours to install each piece of material. In this case, it's predicting 162.25 hours to install all of the half-inch EMT. If we scroll to the last page of the estimate, we can see the total material costs and the total labor hours in the project. In this case, we have $21,148.82 in material in this project and 1,424.2 hours in labor. This is all valuable information, but we can do a lot better. There's a level of breakdown that exists in most estimating software called phases. When you ask the software to compile your estimate for viewing or printing, you can select to have the software split the extended report by phase of construction. These phases come preset and most are split by material type like conduit and fittings wire, devices and trim, switch gear, etc. They're pretty good out of the box and you can use them that way. But I've found that it's fairly easy to reallocate the database and that gives you certain advantages. Our goal is to use the data to schedule and track our project. As the project unfolds, we want to capture the data that will tell us where we struggled to meet the estimate demand and where the hours were abnormally fat. We want to know this in order to pass this information back to the estimator so they can use it to fine-tune future estimates. The more accurate we can make our estimates, the more competitive we can be. We're going to capture this data through time card reporting and we're going to use the phases of construction for our labor reporting cost codes. Your company may already have labor cost codes for tracking labor through your weekly time cards, but if not, you'll want to create your own. These are the cost codes that I use, so I adjusted my estimating software database to report this way. You're welcome to use these cost codes or you can create your own, but it's important to set up the structure to capture this valuable data. This is the circle of data that we're trying to create. It begins with the estimate. We use that information to create a project master schedule. We use the project master schedule to create two week rolling schedules for every member of our crew. We track the individual workers progress against the rolling schedule by having them report their time to complete each task on weekly time cards. This data goes off to the accounting department where it gets entered into the accounting system 
used to pay employees and eventually get sent back to the estimating department as a report on the estimate. The estimating department will use the data to fine tune their future estimates and the cycle will begin all over again. Here's an estimate broken down by phase of construction. The phase breakdown is automatically included in most estimating software and only needs to be selected when the estimate is compiled. As the estimate gets more granular, we're going to get more usable information. This is only the first page of the estimate broken down by phase. You can see the underground feeder conduit phase has 176.08 labor hours, and you can see the underground branch conduit phase has 265.81 labor hours. As the estimate gets more aggregate, it gives us more opportunities to check our progress as we work our way through our project. With the first estimate, which only contained the total hours for the project, we would have to complete the entire project and then match our hours used to the hours estimated in order to determine if we went over or under on man hours. A better way to compare actual to estimated would be to convert the total labor hours estimated into total labor dollars estimated by multiplying the total estimated hours by the average labor rate. With the estimate broken down by phase of construction, we could do the same math and check ourselves as we complete each phase of construction. This could give us an early warning if we're not meeting the labor demand. Here's a copy of the last sheet in the estimate broken down by phase, just so you can see that the total material costs and the labor hours are the same as the previous report. Another way to refine the estimate further is through the use of breakdowns. Breakdowns are additional labels or categories that you can create. By filing materials under these labels, they can be queried in the final report to create an additional level of filtering. For instance, you could assign material to their respective pages in the plans, or if your project is a building with multiple floors, you could separate material by floor. On small to medium sized projects, I like to separate material by circuit home run, like panel A, circuit 135. I find that this creates a manageable task that I can assign to a worker or workers, and that's what we are looking for. We want the estimate to be aggregate enough to create tasks that we can assign and track. Estimates should be aggregate enough to create tasks for workers, but not so aggregate that they become too tedious to track. This means that the larger the project is, the less aggregate you will want the estimate. There are many different ways to break down the estimate for scheduling. We'll talk about more methods in the future, but it's important to make sure your level of detail matches the size of your project or it will be too complicated to track and it won't get done. Let's take a look at an estimate broken down by home run. This is an estimate broken down by circuit number. You can see that it gives the installation time for each circuit worth of materials. Now we're getting close to having something we can schedule our work with. The problem we have with this breakdown is that it includes all of the phases of construction. It includes the raceway work, the wire pulling, and the trim out. Since there's no way we can complete all of this work at the same time, it would still be very difficult to use these hours to schedule workers. Let's refine it one more time. Let's break our circuits down by phase of construction. Here's the breakdown by circuit split up by phase of construction. You can see that the hours are broken out for each task by phase of construction. Now if we want someone to install the raceway for the circuit, we know exactly how many hours it should take them to complete. Two hours. This makes it very easy for us to schedule our work and track the actual installation time through time card entries. There's just one more adjustment to make. 
The best way to structure our estimate is to group all of the tasks by phase of construction so that we can get the hours for individual tasks as well as a total hours per phase of construction. Let me show you what I mean. I've outlined the underground feeder conduit phase. These are the tasks within that phase. Here are the hours for each task and here are the total hours for the phase. This is perfect data for scheduling and tracking our progress. In the next lesson, we'll dive into some estimating software and then I'll show you how to achieve this formatting with the software. I have some homework for you. I've attached all the different estimate breakdowns we covered in this lesson below. I'd like you to print them out and get familiar with them so the estimating lessons will make more sense to you. I also included the drawings for the project they were taken off for. Examine all the takeoffs starting with the first lump sum estimate and compare your ability to understand the estimate based on each one ending at the summary phase estimate. Can you see how much easier it would be to schedule with the summary phase estimate? Take your time and really understand these takeoffs. I'll see you in the next lesson.